I shall hand over to Louise. Uh, Louise is Professor of Sport, Health and Social Sciences and Vice Dean of Research for the College of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences and Research Lead for Welfare, Health and Wellbeing in the Institute of Environment, Health and Societies at Brunel University, London. Her research focuses on the relationship between sport, physical activity and public health and well-being. And she's interested in partnership and community approaches in sport and physical activity and issues of health, well-being, inequality and diversity. So, Louise, over to you. Thanks, Elaine. What a lovely introduction. And thank you to you for organising this. And welcome to Brunel, albeit virtually. Um, part of my work is around research strategy, but I have a deep interest in methods and methodology. And the Brunel masterclasses for us emerged from a piece of work that we delivered alongside some funding from the British Sociological Association in COVID. Um, and that was to develop a co-production um, seminar series for early career researchers and because of COVID it, it all went online but in actual fact that has proved to be a really beneficial forum for getting people together to really explore some of the nitty-gritty issues and exciting issues around research methods and methodologies that, are, that cut across our disciplinary specific and interdisciplinary work and so born out of that was the Brunel Methods Masterclass um, and what's delightful for me as well is to be working with our doctoral researchers um, and some of our um, uh, scholars who are just starting their journeys around methods and methodologies to identify key methods and um, philosophical underpinnings of the way we do our research and, and uh, think about the status and generation of the knowledge in the work that we do um, and to gather people together like this in order to debate those issues. It's, um, it's also just a brilliant way of reaching out to people across the academic world and non-academic world to explore how they're doing these things and what the challenges and issues are that they face. Um, and we've already run masterclasses on uh, the principles and practice of co-production itself, on archival methods, um, and on working with young people. And those have been really fruitful um, and exciting. And we curate these on uh, Bruno YouTube and, and we can give you links to those. And so that is how this particular masterclass on objects and material methods has come to the fore. It's a particular method that Elaine has been working with as a response to not being able to do ethnographic research in the way that she wanted to do through COVID. And that has led us um, into these wonderful relationships with brilliant people who are gonna speak um, today. And so. So um, without further ado, I am going to pass over to um, Professor Sophie Woodward, who's uh, going to give our first uh, talk today. Um, Elaine, do you want me to introduce Sophie's talk or do you want to? Uh, I'm happy to do it. Yeah, why, I, don't, you, yeah. why don't you do it? Because you'll probably do a better job than me. <laughs> but I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Sophie to, um, uh, to Brunel. And we've had a conversation earlier in the week uh, just about the wonderful work that she's doing on objects and material methods. And I was, um, I was drawn to Sophie's work through her most recent book, uh, which is fantastic. And I would recommend everybody read it. I'll probably put it in the chat, Sophie. But Elaine, uh, I'll leave it to you to introduce Sophie's talk for now. Uh, yes, thank you. I can uh, thank you, Louise, um, for your introduction to the whole concept of the masterclass. And um, yes, I similarly can um, highly recommend Sophie's book, uh, which I have used extensively for my research. Um, Sophie is a professor of sociology at the University of Manchester and carries out research, in, research into fashion, clothing, the home, material culture and everyday consumption. She's the author of five books, including the recent Material Methods, Researching and Thinking with Things, which is the book that both uh, Louise and I have just mentioned. She's the co-director for the Morgan Centre for Research into Everyday Lives and co-investigator for the National Centre for Research Methods, where she leads on creative methods. She's currently writing up ethnographically informed research into dormant things, things people keep in the home but are not currently using. And today, Sophie will be presenting on cultural probes and collection based interviews, designing research with object based methods. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Sophie. So when you're ready, Sophie, if you would like to share your screen and I'll leave it with you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. So I've come into material object based methods through something that I've done pretty much through my whole entire academic career and it's something that I got into back when I was doing my PhD and I was interested in women's clothing and I was interested in fashion um, and I oh sorry I've accidentally moved on my thing and when I was doing this research I was really conscious that as a social scientist I knew nothing about the materiality of clothing and I thought how do I understand this the kinds of methods that I had 
recourse to didn't really seem to help me understand this. And I thought, well, uh, how can I do this? You know, do I need to kind of work with people who know about materials or objects? And I think for me, that was the kind of beginning of a journey into object based methods. So when I did my PhD, I did it as an ethnographer, which is very much a kind of open methodological approach where I was able to um, just go out and try loads of methods and so for me a lot of the ways in which I developed the object methods I've used has really been through trial and error because there really wasn't any literature which sort of helped me with that it was very much I'm going to have a go at doing an object interview see what happens see what works and again the same with collection based interviews that I'm going to talk about but um, fortunately there is a lot more literature there now to kind of support you in doing this so in terms of the material methods that I've used I've done ethnographic research I've done object interviews, I've done uh, collection based interviews. There's also methods like follow the thing uh, and cultural probes, which I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about two methods in particular that I've used that are object based, uh, which is collection based, which has formed the majority of my academic research and also cultural probes, just as a way into thinking about kind of how we how we go through the process of designing uh, academic research. So firstly, I just wanted to contextualize this in what, what we mean and what we understand by material methods. So material methods was a term that I first used back in 2016 when I wrote an article about object interviews. And partly it was to try and speak to all of these object based methods that were out there, but hadn't really been brought together. And I think there's all sorts of methods, maybe even within kind of arts based research or design research that I think they are what I would consider to be material methods, even if people themselves don't call them that. Um, and so I, when I, when I wrote the book Material Methods in 2019, I frame material methods in two ways. So the first is that these are methods that help us understand the substantive field of materiality. So this is the idea that people who are interested in material culture or materiality, what methods can they use to understand that? So that goes back to some of what I was saying around wardrobes and the idea that actually I was interested in the materiality of clothing to think about what it is about clothing that helps people construct their identity or think about memories to other people. What is it about the materiality of clothing maybe that allows that? So for me, it was thinking about what methods help me to understand that. But at the same time, I think there's another use of material methods, and this is about methods of researching with things. And I think it's this latter form that's actually the one that has the widest purchase. And perhaps if you're someone who's doing research where you think I'm not that interested in materiality or material culture, this is where these kind of methods might be useful for you. So in some ways, we can kind of think of it as part of this broader repertoire of creative methods, of ways of thinking beyond just straightforward kind of verbal interviews. It's maybe a way of doing research a little bit differently. So it's the idea that in different ways, objects, uh, other forms of material culture are part of how we do our methods. So in the most straightforward one would be the object interview, where instead of just doing an interview where you ask questions and elicit people's verbal responses, we use objects as ways to elicit people's response to that object. So in some ways you could consider it as a kind of different development, maybe of something like the photo elicitation technique. Um, so I think what's really central to this is the idea that objects or whatever methods we use that use objects provoke people to respond in different ways so if you were to do an interview for example where you just ask people about memories and you talk to them about it and then you do an interview where you go through their wardrobe and talk about their memories through clothing you'll get quite different responses now it doesn't mean that one of them is more authentic than the other one but it's just that objects will provoke people to remember in a particular way they, it will be through the fact how they touch the clothing, the sensory experiences. It will also be that they wore these things on their bodies. And so they maybe will remember what it felt like at a certain period of their life. They also hold smells and other things like that. So I think what's key then for me at the heart of any material method is thinking about the ways in which objects can provoke people. And so in lots of ways, then they are quite provocative methods. Now, I use this term provocative methods. I used it once when I did a talk and someone took in the audience took real issue with it because they said that uh, provoking people is a kind of very negative thing. But actually, instead, I just mean it in terms of the idea that objects maybe will get people to respond in particular ways. And we can't always predict how they will respond, but actually that this is a kind of positive thing because it's a way of eliciting different kinds of information that you get 
maybe from something like a straightforward interview. So that, that before I get into the specific methods, I just want to say uh, a general point, which is that materiality ma matters. So as I said previously, there are, I understand material methods in two ways. I understand them one way in terms of understanding materiality, but the second way is when you're researching with things. So in the second way, you might not have any interest in materiality. You might not really know very much about theories of materiality. Um, and in lots of ways, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but you really do need to think about the materiality of the thing that you're engaging with. So this might be theorized in hundreds of different ways, and it's completely beyond the scope of this talk I'm giving today to go through any of these kind of theoretical positions. But the key thing to think about is that whatever theory of materiality that you look at, uh, and they are very, very different. So, for example, I've just put a couple up here. So Alfred Gell talks about material agency, the idea that objects carry the agency of people. Or Jane Bennett talks about vital materials. So she talks about the capacity of materials in relation to other materials to have impacts, uh, to have effects, she talks about. Um, whatever your theory, the idea is that objects are not passive. They bring about effects in their own. So we could think, for example, about the fact that clothing uh, has very different effects to uh, maybe say music. So let's say if you think about memory, you look about memory through music and memory through clothing, you will find that probably they both materialize memory in very different ways. And the key thing to think about then is it may be important for you to think about how are you theorizing things in your research then? But it also predominantly is important to think about this in terms of the practical sense in that actually if I'm doing research with clothing, what might be the issues here? Am I going to get people to touch the clothing? Am I going to get them to try it on? Um, equally with kind of, so I've also done research into stuff people keep in the home. So like an old blender, actually, how, how might that materialize people's memory? It'll be things related to cooking. Where do they keep the item? Who gave it to them? Starting to think through some of the practicalities around materiality. So, so as I say, this might be theoretical, but it also might just be kind of really practical. But the key thing then overall is that things co-constitute social and material relations and the key thing there is it's not just that an individual has an idea that they impose on an object so take the example of clothing you can't just decide i am going to look elegant and force it on the clothing the clothing how it's worn on your body how you feel in it that is what's going to create an appearance or feeling of elegance or not and the clothes might therefore also betray us in our desire to look or feel a particular way so that's just a very brief introduction to how i'm thinking about um material culture, material methods. So I'm going to talk then about two, um, two methods in particular, uh, which I think might be quite interesting for people to think about, because I think object interviews is often the one, well, it's the one that I'm usually asked to talk about. So it's really interesting to speak about a couple of other ones. So this first one, collection-based methods, I think is one that probably I have used uh, the most in my research, because I think it's such an incredibly fruitful um, method and I think in lots of ways it isn't that widely taken up so like object interviews you see are really starting to gain gain traction I think lots of people are using them but I think collection-based methods still maybe aren't taken up as much and I think as soon as you hear collection-based methods often we think about kind of formal collection so like a museum collection or let's say if you're doing research in people's homes which I do somebody's stamp collection or something that they actively collect which is not the way I use it at all. And it's not what I look at at all. But I, when I first started doing my research into wardrobes, I found people saying to me, have you read the stuff on collections? Is that useful? And I thought, well, no, not at all, because a wardrobe isn't a collection in the sense that people aren't deliberately necessarily thinking about what they're going to keep and what they're going to gather. It's also active. It's not uh, some Russell Belt's work. He talks about the collection as special and kept away from everyday use. But actually, a wardrobe is a classic example of a collection that we wear, that we use, um, that's very kind of everyday and mundane. But actually, I started to think that really that was what I was doing with my research into clothing, because I wasn't interested in one object in isolation, because for me, that really didn't get through to people's actual relationship to anything. And actually, people engage, you know, with clothing, it, with a wardrobe, they engage with the totality of clothing that they've got. So I think I found it to be a really useful approach. And I know that has been used by other people, for example, in relationship to music, so music collections. So I wrote an article with someone who did it based on people's uh, music collections. 
So when I use the term collection, I'm using it in terms of referring to several objects rather than one. Uh, and uh, as I say, there's obviously lots of different things you could apply this to. So in terms of what methods that are based on collections offer, I think, first of all, it's good if you're interested in a particular collection. So I was interested in clothing, but my initial, my first book is based on wardrobes, women's wardrobes. Um, and now, for example, in my current research, I look at what people have in their attics and in their garages and in their drawers. So this is a slightly more nebulous collection and it's a series of things kept over the house. But I'm interested in a collection. So it's a kind of method that helps me understand that thing. Also, I think the other thing is that maybe theoretically. So I'm also interested theoretically in things in relation to each other. So there are theories of material culture which think about the relationship between an individual and their objects. So Daniel Miller's early work, for example, talks about theories of objectification, the ways in which the ob person um, develops a relationship through the object. So maybe an individual and their clothing. Uh, but I'm interested in things in relation to each other because actually individual items of clothing derive their meaning from the whole collection. Um, and so for me, that's something, and I was interested, for example, in things that people didn't wear as much as what they did wear. I think it's also interesting, finally, methodologically, because I think even though I was interested, say, in clothing, actually, when I did the research, what came out of it was so much material on how people remember. So loads of stuff on memory, their biography, people's life history. So they would tell me their life history through their clothes. Also, everyday relationships, so how people related to their family, how people related to their children, how they related to their friends, what different kinds of relationships they had. So actually, in lots of ways, the wardrobe then was a route into these other things. And I think there's a lot of methodological potential here in collection based methods. So you can use a collection as a way to understand something else. So you could do wardrobe based research in thinking about life history, for example, or memory, or how do people relate to other people or work life balance, for example. You could easily do that through collection based methods. So I think there's a lot of potential here and that therefore opens it up, I think, as a method for lots of different people um, to use in their research. So just to give you an example, talk of uh, cases, I've talked about the wardrobe research a little bit more, but uh, my current research, uh, well, I've done the empirical research, I'm kind of supposed to be writing it up at the moment, uh, is into dormant things. So dormant things are things that I have defined as things that people keep, but they're not currently using in the home. So, you know, old phone cables, uh, inherited items of clothing, skis that people keep, but they're never going to go skiing again, that kind of thing, huge range of objects. So theoretically, I approach this through a version of something called assemblage theory, uh, which is written by Jane Bennett, put 2019, it's actually 2009, sorry, it's a miss, miss uh, type, typo there. Um, and essentially, this theoretical approach is really interest in the relations between things. So the idea that, for example, an individual item gets, gets its kind of the power from what it's with. So let's say people have a junk drawer, which everyone seems to have, which is a junk, a drawer often in the kitchen where they throw things that are not sure what to do with that might be useful. Things like old cables, for example, um, and, you know, uh, drawing pins, even if they're never going to use drawing pins again. So something in a drawer like that is seen as junk. But as soon as you take that thing out and think, oh, that reminds me of my mom, and you put it in a memory box, it acquires a completely different kind of meaning. So I'm really interested then in how individual things get their meanings as well from other things. It's not just that they have meaning in and of themselves. It's where they are and what they're put with. So therefore, the emphasis then also is on the power of the whole. So like one item that's sort of seen as rubbish, we don't really think about it. When you've got a huge pile of clutter that overwhelms a room or a table, then it has a power over us that we feel that we have to deal with it or get rid of it. So in terms of the actual method, sorry, I don't know why that's gone as... Oops, no, there we go. Uh, in terms of the methods, I um, use lots of different methods. So I did house tours of people's houses where they walked me. In fact, that was the first method I did. I got them to walk me through the house and they'd show me all the dormant things they had, the spaces they kept stuff. I also did interviews with people where they told me about their attitudes to clutter, their ideal home, things they got rid of. I also did photography. So I took my own photos, um, mostly just so as I could remind myself of what people had. Uh, I also had a sketcher who worked with me. So Lynn Chapman, uh, I didn't do any sketching myself. I'm not very good at drawing, but Lynn is a sketcher and she live sketched some of my interviews. So she kind of did sketches herself and wrote little quotes around them, which was a really interesting way of thinking about um, objects, actually, these kind of arts-based methods and bring them to bear 
um, on objects in a way that actually I found that photos often don't really capture. I mean, I, I sorry, it's an entire tangent, huge subject that, but actually the limitations in, in lots of ways of photography and that I'm a terrible photographer, but I take photos to remember things, but actually often I look at my photos and I think they just don't capture that thing and what it meant to people in a way that sometimes the, the uh, drawings do. Um, I also did mapping, so I map people's houses and map the things in it. Uh, so I did sampling through houses because I was really interested, not in any particular kind of people, but I was interested in these big old Victorian houses with an attic and a garage and loads of storage space. But also what about a small flat or a modern house with no storage? How do people deal with their stuff in these spaces? So as I said, I did walking tours of all the spaces and objects in the house. So as you can imagine the amount of stuff that people have. I couldn't possibly look at everything. So it was a really good way to get a feel for the overall spaces. So there's a picture there of someone's attic underneath the stairs and a load of old paint. There's a junk drawer there, a um, pile of clutter on someone's kitchen table, someone's uh, garage, some boxes, which the person actually had no idea what the boxes were. And we had to go lift up the lid and realize some of them were husband's old childhood things and all sorts of different kinds of objects. So the walking tour was a really good way to get a feel for the relationship between objects and spaces and also to understand what people, how much people knew what was there and how they didn't know what was there. Uh, and then finally, I did audits of a specific space. So I asked people, could you choose one space that has dormant things? And we did interviews around them. So uh, some people, it was a kind of attic they chose. And this woman on the right chose her drawer of fabric, which she's keeping just in case she's going to make something one day. And even if she may never do that, she keeps the objects because she wants to think of herself as someone who will do that when she's older and she will take up sewing again and she will start making things. So it's a really interesting way of thinking about her future and how she imagines the rest of her retirement um, in terms of the kind of, you know, the, the, the kinds of um, the kinds of sort of way she imagines herself. And I think what what comes out of this particular collection based research is the idea that things provoke people to respond in the interview. And I think they see things differently because in the audit interviews, you're looking at objects that they forget are even there. So people will go into the attic and just dump another thing up there or they won't even look in that drawer because they think I'm not going to use that fabric today. But actually sitting and getting people to reflect on it, they are encountering the object again and they are reflecting on themselves and their own lives in a very different way. And so it's a really fascinating method, I think, um, to think about all sorts of different things. As I say here, help me to think about how people saw their futures, but you could use it for all sorts of different kinds of research. Uh, so the second method I'm going to uh, talk about very briefly is... Um, Cultural probes. So this is a method that originates in design. Um, and I think it's a really interesting method. It's taken off massively in certain fields and not so much in others. And it's basically a method that encourages people to respond to a pack of customized or designed objects. So what you do is you create a pack of objects like a camera, a map, or in one research project, people did a dream recorder. So a little audio recorder where you could record your dreams when you wake up that's sent to people with a series of tasks attached to them. So this is an example of a pack uh, image on the right that I found from someone who'd used them. And what this method does is it very much draws on how things can be provocative because it's different types of objects. And the idea is that these people respond differently to them. So they are intentionally really thinking about provoking people. It's not about trying to get exactly the same information from everyone. It's trying to sort of see what, what would happen if we give people a dream recorder. Some people say they don't dream and won't record anything. Others, it will be such an evocative method. It's thinking about uh, sometimes quite a playful approach to research. So often we don't think about research design as a playful thing. But that's very much what cultural probes is. It's about playing with different possibilities but also encouraging people to maybe be playful to getting them to do little sketches or take photos or things like that um, and it's been developed in art design disciplines um, so Bill Gaver and colleagues at the Royal College of Art in 1999 developed this in their research with the elderly and the point of this method was it was very much um, an open-ended so it wasn't about solving problems uh, and they did research in the elderly and it was about challenging stereotypes so often older people were seen as kind of all sorts of stereotypes. And they thought, actually, we don't usually think about old people in terms of playfulness, but actually these kind of methods unlocked all sorts of different ways of understanding older populations and how um, their living, living arrangements and design of living spaces could be done differently.
So they very much in the research design, the focus is on the personalized and the informal. So they did little postcards in it, for example, that said, tell us advice you've had or what's the things your mother used to say or random little comments like that that people could respond to. And they had maps in there. And one of the instructions was, where do you like to daydream or where do you like to do meet with friends or this kind of thing? So they're very kind of creative and about kind of opening up how people might respond rather than determining we need this amount of information and we want to get it. It's open ended to what you might find. And the idea is you might be surprised. Very participant led uh, as well. So uh, finally, just in terms of some of the challenges and possibilities, the big issue is people don't respond um, to this in that people will either love it or they'll hate it. Uh, and I think it's very, very true that some people think, oh, what do you mean a dream catcher? I'm, I'm not putting my dreams down. Whereas others, it will be the best thing they've ever done and they'll love doing it. Um, you might also not get useful information. You might get people to respond, but it isn't helpful for what you're trying to find out. Um, you also need to be really good at design. So I've done done this a little bit in a project we did. We weren't really basic in the design, but it might be worth if you're interested in this, either if you're good at design or collaborating with someone who's good at designing. Um, and I think that this offers potential for like really interesting insights, challenges stereotypes, and it's also really participatory in that actually people are very clear that they can respond or not. They can ignore some of the objects in the probe and just really respond to the ones they like. Um, there's a lot of practical considerations, so you have to make sure your design fits with your questions. So if you're going for a playful approach, your design needs to be playful. You have to think about aesthetics. So will this pack appeal to people, the, the people that we're giving it to? How can we customise it? How can it be delivered? And so some of the people in Gavers Research, they did it like a gift. So it was like giving people a gift. And so they really kind of engaged with the whole process. Um, there's a lot of practical considerations to think about. But I think taking... Together, finally, this and the collection based methods, I think they very much are drawing on the capacities of different things and what things can do and what responses they can generate in people. They can be slightly unpredictable in some ways, but I think you do need to kind of try and think through materiality with the pros. Imagine what it would be like if someone got one of these um, and these can be practical. They can also be theoretical considerations or I guess piloting them. Um, is a really good idea but I think they're for me I think both of these are just really exciting possibilities um, and I've done a lot of collection-based research less of the cultural probes but I think there's a lot of potential for these being used in terms of kind of creative and different ways of approaching whatever your research topic is and I'm going to stop there because I think I've talked for my amount of time so uh, thank you very much that's fabulous thank you so much um, Sophie, that was really interesting. And um, it, it links in quite nicely, actually, with um, what Jean's going to be talking about. I think the cultural pro probes, certainly. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat currently. If anybody's got a question, either feel free to unmute yourself. And oh, here we are. Beck's got her hand raised. Um, let me. Oh, fantastic. Beck, you've unmuted yourself. If you'd like to ask your question, feel free to go ahead. Um Yes, and also I just wanted to kind of add to what you'd said at the start is um, before I even knew um, that Sophie was presenting today, like last week I read the book and it was amazing, so <laughs> um, highly recommend. Um, and I'm coming at this from like a historian perspective um, and you kind of touched on it a little bit in the book about how um, we don't always have access to people to be able to do these kind of things um, with. So I was just wondering if you had any kind of advice on how like researchers who aren't engaging with other people, um, how they might kind of use material methods to like provoke new ways of thinking um, and how they might approach objects and maybe what questions they might ask um, or perspectives they might take to kind of generate those new ideas. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting question because I almost have come, come at this with the opposite way in that I do research with people who are alive and who are there. But actually, I think as a tent because of that, we tend to prioritise what people say over the stuff. And I think... That's been a limitation, I think, of lots of social science research in that we do an object interview. And I've done it myself where I listen to someone's narrative and I prioritize that over actually what the stuff can tell me itself. And so I think I've learned a lot 
conversely from kind of archaeological and historical disciplines but I think what what I think is really interesting with historical disciplines where I guess the equivalent maybe would be where you've got a lot of written stuff and where actually if you've got maybe written accounts you can sometimes these can almost take priorities over the ways in which we understand the materiality of the time so I guess um it's two things I'd say one is taking a material culture approach to a topic that people haven't historically I think becomes incredibly interesting so one of the things I used in my book was Sasha Handley's work on sleep and she looks at material culture of sleep in early modern Europe and it's really interesting because she focuses on the materiality so you know the beds the design what data we've got on the beds and what survived and what hasn't and house layout um, and then the other thing I think is really and this is something that's not just about historical research but also about contemporary research is the ways in which uh, the material is made present in written or verbal accounts. Because if you work on a historical period where there is the written accounts, but I also think that's true about contemporary stuff where having said that we prioritize the verbal, I got to a point where I was thinking, you know, we really need to think about the material. Whereas actually, if you listen to what people say and you're tuning yourself into the material, it actually emerges in all sorts of interesting ways. So you could almost with historical data think about that as a kind of analytical route into reinterpreting the data. And I think there's a lot of potential in that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. That was very insightful and it's given me a lot to think about. Thank you for a great question. Um, Obren, ap apologies if I've mispronounced your name, but do you have a question for Sophie? Indeed I do. Good uh, morning, Kiara from down here. Um, Thank you. This was a really, really interesting uh, talk. I was uh, wondering um, how you chose the objects to uh, provoke a reaction. So I suppose that you were first, well, you were encountering the uh, well, objects in the house uh, for the first time during the walk-in tour. So how best, you know, how did you choose or how best might one choose the objects to present to the subjects to provoke a reaction. And um, also, sort of, have you dealt with uh, people who have a lot of stuff or um, which, well, some might consider uh, as having a hoarding disorder? And how did you uh, deal with that um, situation? Thank you. Yeah, so my the object in my research is tended to be participant chosen objects. So lots of people get you know choose objects for people but for mine I got people to choose so when I did say the collection audits where I said let's choose one space and really go into detail on it I let them choose because I think occasionally people have things they don't want to show me or they really want to talk about something so for me that was a really helpful uh route but also I think sometimes the objects that were the most provocative or had the most response are ones that they were kind of surprised by so one woman chose a collection of her, a memory box that her parents had given her that she kept from her sort of teenage university years and actually there were things in there that they they weren't provocative in that they didn't you know give her like memories she'd you know it wasn't about kind of horrifying memories it was more about objects she'd forgotten she had that were very like a poster she had on a wall at uni mm -hmm. and that actually it was just like she'd seen that every day and it so powerfully made her remember what it was like to be at uni so um, it's a combination for me of being participant led, but also um, the kind of, and that's the advantage of seeing objects in context is it's things that people themselves are surprised by, even though they're their own objects. Um, and then finally, the thing about hoarding, I didn't encounter anyone who I would consider to be excessively a hoarder, but I did encounter people with a lot of stuff. Um, so one person who had to move out of her room when she actually tidied, when she had a full sort out because there was no room for anything. Um, but I would say there was a massive anxiety around being seen as a hoarder. So that was almost like me going to their houses. Everyone would say to me, how bad am I? Uh, even people who didn't have very much stuff. It's like, how bad am I on the scale? And it was almost like part of my role was to say, it's OK. You are absolved of any like, you know, responsibility. And I'd, I'd always show them photos of my house as well because I have tons of stuff everywhere so I just thought it kind of made everyone feel a bit better because I was uh, kind of sh sharing my home as well so yeah. Thank you kindly. Thank you Aubren a really interesting question and actually I wish we had a lot more time because I would love to understand 
um, the differences that the age of the property made to what you discovered and, you know, the spaces available for where people keep their things. So, yeah, super interesting. Um, I'll just have one last question stroke comment from Louise and then we'll move on to Jean. Louise, you've got your hand up. So. Yeah, thanks, Elaine. And, and thanks for that. So, so, so much richness in that, Sophie. Really um, excited. I'm so excited. I nearly forgot to tweet, but I have done it. Um, I just what struck me in all of that and you picked up on it a little bit, but I just wondered what, how much you theorised it or explored it is is a sort of sense of space and place in the materiality of what goes on so you know in some of those pictures there are things that things go in and and those things are organized in certain ways in certain places and spaces i think the narrative of place and space at the moment particularly in the work i do is about outdoor big kind of spaces and places but it struck me that that indoor home-based stuff is is just really central to how people make sense of the, their objects or the materiality of it. Yeah, I, absolutely massively so. And that's why I think I decided to start all of my interviews with this house tour. And mm -hmm. I did have some reservations over, it. are people gonna wanna do this? Like they've literally just agreed to the research and I'm basically saying, come on, let's go in your attic kind of thing. But everybody went for it. So, you know, and I said, you know, it's fine, you don't have to, but everyone went for that. And it was a great starting point because it really helped situate things. So it meant that any smaller scale understanding we did about particular objects people wanted to talk about or particular spaces meant that I had a sense of what was going on it, it, in the spaces of the whole home. So some people had houses with loads of space. So like one of the photos I showed was someone who had a garage and they've never had a car in it, never. And I don't think anyone has cars in garages anymore. That's become the new attic because lots of people don't have, and that was a modern home. So they had no attic or storage space. And, and so it's really, it becomes really interesting. And, you know, I had other houses where someone lived in a really modern house. It was absolutely tiny. Her family could barely fit in. And so behind the sofa, they had a load of stuff stored because there was just no space. Um, and so I think, it's really fascinating to think about the spatial ar arrangements of stuff in the house and what's considered out of the way and what's considered visible and then what's visible, what's hidden away in a box or a drawer and how that affects the role stuff plays. There's so much in there uh, in terms of that. Yeah. Elaine, there's one question in the in the chat, which I think we can we can go to. Do you want me to just quickly articulate it? Yeah, you can do. I'm just a little bit mindful of time, but okay. if you're happy for right. us to just take very, this one. A quick, just a quick a comment, maybe, quick Sophie. One. Yeah, for, um, from Mary, and thank, thanks for your coming, and thanks for recognising we're time short here. Um, but we're, we're, the question is about socioeconomic context, whether that changes things substantially. So if you did this research in another, maybe less materialistic society or context, do you, do you think that would have an impact? Yeah, I mean, I think it would. I think there's, and even within the context I did, I did people people were from very different socioeconomic backgrounds you know there were people who really struggling financially through to people someone living on their own in a massive victorian house and that makes a massive difference in that it's not that the people with the big space have more stuff it's that they can afford to store stuff whereas the people in the smaller spaces for economic reasons need to keep stuff because they might need it you know they really might need that object but they don't have the space for it so I think there's some really quite complex things going on there in that it doesn't mean that more money, more stuff, but it means that they have more space and therefore they don't need to see the stuff. Um, but I think it'd be really interesting to do it in a different context. Um, and yeah, and who knows what you'd find out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie, for your insight and thank you for the questions. Um, we shall move on to our next speaker now, which is Professor Jean Williams. Um, Jean is an independent researcher who's written extensively on oral history and links with object-based research, working with museums, including the FIFA Museum of World Football in Zurich, the National Football Museum and the Silverstone Interactive Museum. Jean has written the national elements of the Women's Euro 2022 public exhibitions, such as monoliths in fan zones and public transport. Today, Jean will be sharing with us her presentation on storytelling using object-based oral history. I will just get your slides up, Jean, and then it's over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Elaine, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Um, I have spoken uh, previously on the oral history um, session that Brunel Masterclass did, and I spoke initially about the limitations of using photographs as objects. 
Mm, and the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the the revealing and then I'm going to move on to the prestigious and if I um, have time I'll talk about the monumental. Um, so I first got interested in this particular topic um, through working with museums and the materiality of sport is often overlooked. Um, I got very interested also in kit um, and fashioning the body for sport. So the, the interaction between sport is an embodied experience, the life of objects and the life of people and how those two interconnect. So I, I began with this particular photograph um, and it's from the 1912 Stockholm Olympic Games. And again, a lot of people are surprised by the timing of this photograph that it would be 1912. Um, so there are obviously five key women in this photograph and initially I was drawn to the juxtaposition of the very buttoned up chaperone in the middle with how the swimmers were revealed. And that led me on a journey um, in terms of I wanted to see if I could find one of these swimming costumes. So I went from the photograph as the object to the story behind how the um, swimming costumes were made, worn, and then what happened to them. So it's the journey of the object of the swimming costumes. Um, so if you, if you haven't got any Olympic history, just a little bit of context. When Charlotte Cooper, a tennis player, won Britain's first uh, women's victory at the Olympic Games in Paris in 1900, she was part of a middle class amateur tradition. Jenny Fletcher, who is the woman on the second left, uh, she's got her feet like a ballet dancer in front of her. That's Jenny Fletcher um, and she's from Leicester, which is about 10 miles from where I live. Um, she was a very different sporting hero. She won a bronze medal in the 100 metre freestyle event, which was Britain's first individual Olympic female swimming medal at the Stockholm Games in 1912. Here she appears with her um, relay colleagues, also for the 100 metre freestyle event. Uh, Fletcher was also part of the gold winning four by 100 metre freestyle relay. And the role of the working class female amateur has been neglected as an aspect of Olympic history. So my recent book was Britain's um, Olympic women and looking at who they were combining oral history with material objects. Jenny Fletcher worked in a clothing factory for 12 hours a day, six days a week and swam in what little spare time she had. Nevertheless, she did train and swim extensively between 1903 and 1913. And by the time of her 1912 victories, Jenny Fletcher had held the 100 yard freestyle women's world record since 1906 and the English Championship also since 1906. So I'm a swimmer myself and I connect the material aspects with the embodied aspects. Uh, Jenny Fletcher, as you can see from this photograph, when she won her medals, she, she swam outdoors. They were actually in, in a facility that was outdoors in 1912. And I do quite a lot of outdoor swimming just to kind of see what it feels like to kind of connect um, with the with the objects and the the kind of embodied nature of it so the degree of specialist preparation undertaken for competition include nutritional training swimming outdoors and the use of clothing technology uh, Jenny Fletcher was also coached and advised by some of the finest swimmers of her day these included the amateur John Jarvis, who was from Leicester, and the professional um, Joey Nuttall, co-inventors of the Jarvis Nuttall kick. Now, I know that not all of you are historians of sport, but the freestyle stroke, the crawl, which we think of today, was not standardised by the time that she was swimming. So it, it's really part of how the clothing was part of um, technological advances in swimming at the time. Uh, she may well have combined this with a trudging arm action, which again, you can look it up on the search engine of your choice. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it though. Um, and so I, I've theorised this to be aquadynamics, a concern for the technical properties of swimming costumes in the career of Jenny Fletcher. Um, as we can see from the photograph, she's wearing a light. I later found out through um, catalogues, it was a silk 
one piece racing swimsuit, which represented a new kind of modernity. And it defined the appearance of the female swimmer through her competitive aspirations rather than through modesty. Um, and this is often overlooked in terms of athletocracy that Jenny could um, compete at the level that she was able to and kind of defy her um, working class background. She was sent by the British Olympic Association to Stockholm as their representative. Um, and so then I went on a journey to try to find one of these silk swimsuits. Um, silk, as we know, was sourced from the British Empire and traded with China, often used for undergarments and finery. Um, and here I co connected with some theories from business history. I used to share um, an office with Dill Porter, who some people on the call may well know. And Dill is very fond of a, a theory um, from business history called vert vertical integration. And what this means is new applications of existing technologies, but also new markets requiring innovations in technology. And that's what we can see in this swimsuit. For instance, um, there was a Leicester company called Cora's and as swimwear became more brief after the Victorian era, undergarment techniques and fabrics became outerwear. So actually, you know, silk stockings were, were nothing new, but this was being used in swimming technology. Um, so gossamer were these racing silk suits. Uh, they weighed no more than two ounces that they were able to pass through a wedding ring. Uh, and the swimmers, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the photograph, were obliged to wear gowns when out of the water, if over the age of 12. But somebody has persuaded them to leave those gowns on the side and be photographed in their swimming costumes. Um, again, it's really interesting because it's actually a male silhouette. It's quite a male silhouette that they're wearing because you can see what were called athletes the knickers that you can see were called athletes or athlete slips and so somebody's thought about covering their modesty on the bottom half of their bodies but Jenny Fletcher's nipples can quite clearly be seen in the photograph so nobody had thought about any kind of support garments for for these um, swimsuits which were broadly based on the on the male swimsuits um you won't be surprised to find something so um, gossamer. I, I never actually did find um, a, a copy of the racing swimsuit. Um, I went and looked at the IOC Museum in Lausanne. I went over to the Fashion and Technology Institute collections in New York in the US. I went to the Amateur Swimming Association. I went to the British Olympic Association. And again, if we talk about the lives of these objects, there are a number of reasons why I didn't find a surviving copy. Uh, I went to auctions. There were a lot of Olympic auctions in uh, 2012. Um, and the fragility was always unlikely to survive. The other thing that is significant about them is that they were enormously expensive. So these cost 10 shillings in 1912. And Jenny Fletcher probably you know, was paid pennies uh, for her work. So it's not something that she would probably have managed to buy for herself. Although we can see that the women have had to sew on their own um, British Olympic Association flags. But it's quite likely that the Amateur Swimming Association bought these and kept them because they would have been such valuable items of kit. Um, and what you get very often is if we think of football shirts, you know, for instance, a Maradona football shirt recently passed hands for millions of pounds. Um, very often then objects of sporting note can go into museums and be preserved forever uh, if they're linked with a significant person. But there is no National Sporting Museum or Olympic Museum um, in the UK which is quite weird if you think about it, that would save and preserve these objects. Um, so like most social history, it's likely to have been discarded at some point when it became a redundant technology 
when synthetics began to be used for the Olympic swimsuits in the 1950s, that it would have been discarded or reused or repurposed. Um, and another contributing factor was that Jenny married in 1913. Her husband was injured in the First World War and they moved, they migrated to live on a farm in Canada where she served out the rest of uh, her life. And um, when I contacted the family who are Canadian, you know, they're not that interested in British Olympic history. Um, there was not that much call for racing silk suit in Canada and um, they were not that interested in, in helping me to track it down anyway. So the, the life of object, I'll never know the end of the life of that particular object. Um, if we could move on to the second image, please, Elaine. Right, so this, this is a newer object, and, and here I'm interested in the connections between contemporary history and um, older history. So this goes back to my work on women's football. These caps were given to the first 17 women to play for England, uh, women's national football team on Friday night, last Friday, at Wembley. And I've been doing research with the FA um, to try to track down every woman who's played for England since 1972. What's really interesting about that is that um, the FA don't have the records so that they needed that work to be done. And just to put that in context, the first England men's international was 1872. Um, and the first women's international was almost exactly 100 years later on the 18th of November, 1972. So we tried to recall that, that 50 years of history so that the women could get their recognition. Um, uh, again, if you're not a historian of sport, you may not know that women's football was banned by the FA. Uh, from 1921 to 1969. So the women who played in 1972 were some of the early pioneers. And um, this shirt and cap was actually given to Sylvia Gore, who had played during the ban on women's football, uh, including for Manchester Corinthians and Foden's. But she scored the first official game for England um, sorry, first official goal for England in 1972, uh, and England beat Scotland 3-2. But the women's FA that ran women's football uh, as an arm of the FA in 1972 was so poor that the England women's team played only one international match, and that was against Scotland. Scotland was so poor um, that when they went to their penultimate practice before this international match and their van broke down, um, they hitched a ride in a removal lorry and sat in armchairs and sofas and all the rest of it to get to the match. So it was done on, on an absolute shoestring. And um, the WFA again had absolutely no money. So a volunteer called Flo Bilton made the England women players of 1972 a homemade cap um, out of her own funds and stitched it. And I've seen several examples of, of the caps. This cap, however, is made by a company called Toy, Kenning and Spencer. And again, the history of this cap is quite different. Not only has it taken 50 years for it to be awarded, but um, it's been made by a very, very prestigious company, not by handmade by Flo Bilton. Um, and just to give an, a context of how tardy the FA have been um, in giving these caps, um, Jill Coulthard, the first woman to 100 caps for England, um, got her uh, 100th um, cap in the 1990s. The, only the ever fifth ever England player to complete the feat and the only amateur behind Billy Wright, Bobby Moore, Bobby Charlton and Gordon Banks. Um, it took the FA 15 years to give Jill her golden cap. So the slowness of the symbolic recognition of these women to, to have their official FA caps 
it's been really challenging for me as a researcher um, to think ethically about how I can have a positive role in the memorialization of um, their careers. And I'm really interested in these tensions between deliberate acts of memorialization and deliberate acts of forgetting, of rewriting an omission um, that, that effectively reinforces women's subaltern position in sport and particularly by the, by the FA. So I posted this image on my um, social media on Friday night and one of the responses that I got was, um, not only did this take 50 years, but they didn't even bother to iron Sylvia's shirt. Uh, it's literally come out of the wrapper and been put on a hanger that's an inappropriate hanger. Um, and so the whole thing looks a little bit rushed. Again, going back to the life cycle of the object, because we're at, uh, unusually as a historian, I'm dealing with a, a, an object that's just been created and is quite new. So I'm interested now in where this object is going to go. So Toy Kenning and Spencer manufactured the caps, uh, calling themselves a great British company. It originally started life in 1685 when a huge no weaver fled France for London. Um, in Bethnal Green, a traditional place of refuge for migrants, he weaved fine silver laces, gold braiding and velvet for the gentry. Um, he then morphed the business model to embroidered flags uh, for trade unions. And then in the 1930s, with the coronation of George VI and Queen Elizabeth, toys made robes, cushions, insignia, and the ceremonial aspects um, of, uh, of the coronation. Uh, again, very active in the 1948 Olympic Games and Queen Elizabeth's coronation. And as recently as 1992, made a replica of the original FA Cup for the FA. So the caps themselves are of the highest quality, but the symbolism combines militaristic regalia and insignia. And it also tells us about migration, uh, particularly in the context of handing these over in, in the middle of um, a financial meltdown as a result of, of Brexit and the conservative policy. Uh, how migration has shaped a sense of Britishness in what is perceived to be a very traditional craft. Interestingly as well, the caps are essentially a useless item. Uh, no one is walking the dog in their cap this winter, I'm guessing. So where will their eventual, eventual life as an object take them now? Into a museum, into someone's loft, auctioned off as so many of the male England male players, uh, 66 World Cup medals were when times got hard, into the hands of private collectors, cherished by family and pride of place, and it, it remains to be seen. Um, I've run out of time to talk about the, the context of handing these over at Wembley, um, but if you've taken the, the tour at Wembley, it's very often presented. Could you move on to the just the final slide, please, Elaine? Um, these were handed over at Wembley, as I said, on um, Friday night, and this is five of the original players wearing their caps. And one of the things I got really interested in is the, the monumentalism of Wembley and the way in which, with the Women's Euros victory there, uh, and this particular match against the USA, the world champions on Friday night, that actually Wembley is being reinscribed and rewritten as a place where women's football makes its history. And given that the FA ban on women's football, particularly related to uh, a ban on them being able to use FA affiliated pitches, um, the way in which the FA is recasting itself as a progressive institution, albeit very um, belatedly, um, was for me really, really interesting. So I think I'll, I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. So interesting. And uh, I'm sure it's provoked a lot of um, questions in our um, masses. So let's have a look, um, see if anybody's posted anything in the chat. 
Okay, let's have a look. I do apologise if that was not showing correctly on your screens, by the way. Um, it was difficult for me to see what you could see, so... Uh, okay, so... So Louise has made a comment there, uh, so much here on the intertwined character of socio-historical material relations and speaking to nationalism and commercialization in many ways. So you covered that off a little bit um, in your talk anyway, Jean. But Louise, did you want to add some more to that comment? Yeah, I just got a, qu a question. You, you, you touched on it, but, but um, I'm sure there's so much uh, more to say, Jean. But just the idea of memorization, because I also think it's reflected in Sophie's work around pr provocation and, and remembering things and the power for some for an object to remember things, but also this complexity about the way in which things are remembered and who remembers what in what context. And of course, there's a probably a historical point uh, there around, you know, which memories are allowed to be remembered, if you know what I mean. Totally. Yes. In fact, yeah. Um, so to give the example, we had had a previous um, reunion at Wembley Louise back in um, November 2019 at which there was an unofficial England team went out to the unofficial Mexico World Cup and uh, the daughter of one of those players Gail Ems is herself um, an Olympic badminton silver medalist and she'd written to the FA and said, it's ridiculous that you don't recognise my mother's achievements, but you, you do recognise the players from 1972. So there was a reception for those players because of this complaint by Gail Ems, but they were kept in a separate room from the official players and they were not allowed to walk around the pitch at half time. And they had a half time talk from Sue Campbell. And weirdly, because I'd helped with the reunion of the official players, I'm super friendly with the 71 players and I was not allowed in the room to see them. They were kept almost physically um, apart. And so th that's exactly my point is that these acts of memorialization are also deliberate acts of forgetting. Mm -hmm. And it shows what an immature organization the FA is He's even at 160 years old that they are unable to reconcile their own banning of women's football by insisting that people who played at that time were unofficial. Mm. They still can't resolve that. And, and if you think of some of the big, in a way, football is quite a trivial thing. Uh, it's when you think of some of the um, problems that we've had across, you know, global society in the past and how, um, societies have dealt with much bigger conflicts than that mm. and the reconciliations that there have been it's it's kind of interesting that this act of memorialization also requires a deliberate forgetting mm. yeah yeah it's, it's brilliant thank you I'll hand thank back you. to you uh, Elaine yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I've just got one quick comment, straight question for you um, around the symbolism, which again sort of talks to this, you know, the things that you choose to acknowledge and the things that you choose to forget and the symbolism of those caps and the history that you've acknowledged has been, you know, recognised in the, the giving of these caps. Um, sort of playing a little bit towards linking it with the way that Sophie uses objects. Have you used any of those objects that you've been researching to actually interview any of the people who've received these caps to see the significance and symbolism that they see in the items? Or are you looking at it more from a historical perspective from the FA and its history? Well, what, what's super interesting about that, I mean, obviously on Friday, the players who got their caps and, and by now, I, I mean, I should just say, there is something like 225 women who played for England. Um, and only 20 were given their caps on Friday night. Um, so th there is much more work to be done on that. And they were super excited. You know, they've waited 50 years. I mean, Sylvia Gore, I should have said, Sylvia Gore's not with us anymore. It was her nephew and her cousin who had to go along to that. So, um, uh, and, and a lot of them are in their 70s and not particularly well. So they were super excited on, on Friday, but they value their flow built-in cap. Um, I wouldn't say as much, but they highly value it because it was of the time and made out of love 
and something that had, somebody had done by hand and it was an acknowledgement of their career. So I think it's really interesting the way those two objects speak to one another, uh, one perhaps more valuable in its materials and the other more valuable in its impulse, shall I say. Yeah. And the timing of it is significant, yeah? So one was a, a reactionary thing to the event at the time, um, and the other one is more uh, significant in, yeah, it trying to mark something from the FA's perspective rather than necessarily to mark the achievement of the women. So, um, yeah, depending on how you look at it. Um, Beck has got a question, and then we've got one in the chat. Um, so, Beck, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, and thank you, Jean. That was a really fascinating talk. I was I was wondering if you um, had any comments on like how you've managed um, the relationship with the FA when it's obviously brought up some tensions at some point. But have you also been kind of dependent on them for like access and kind of like a, a gatekeeping organisation almost? And how have you kind of managed that? What I'd imagine would be quite a difficult relationship, um, <laughs> considering the stories that you've told us. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting, actually. If, if people are at the start of their PhD journey, um, so when I started my PhD journey in um, 1997, I played football, I ran the East Midlands League, I coached football, um, I was just embedded in the subculture. And so if I went to, if I went to a tournament, I could see if somebody got yellow boots on and were, was wearing a bandana that she thought she was good. So that's the first person you're going to tackle, right? Because you, you kind of understand the symbolism that she's giving out just by rocking up dress like that. Um, and the FA had funded an official uh, PhD researcher um, at Leicester University. And so I would trot along to various things with my questionnaires and they'd say, sorry, we can't let you in. Uh, we've got an official researcher doing this. And I thought, oh, stuff this, I'm gonna stand on the steps then and, and give out my questionnaires. Um, and people would say, why are you standing outside with your questionnaires? And I'd say, well, cause they won't let me in which kind of got me a lot of sympathy, I think. Um, but also, uh, I, I just knew a lot of people in the network. So I've always had an interesting relationship with the FA and you do rely on them as gatekeepers for the information. Um, but I think in this case, it was one of those, obviously it's 20 years later. So the people who were not terribly helpful in 1997 have, mellowed somewhat in the last 20 plus years um, but also they recognize as an organization that they need to be doing this work because a lot of the good sports governing bodies like uh, rugby union have, have already given their women their legacy numbers so that they know they're not looking progressive which then does give an opportunity to have conversations with them about you know kind of being on the right side of history so um, I've, I've done a lot of that work and I have to say it's absolutely come from the top. So I'd, I did a little bit of history work with Phil Neville and Gareth Southgate because some of the men don't know who Bobby Moore is, let alone the women having heard of Sue Bucket. Um, and Serena Weigman, absolutely, because she was that person as a player who recognizes the ban and all the rest of it she's absolutely supported the historical work including with the England women's squad so Leah Williamson and the others recognize the part that the earlier generations now play um, and Serena has been key to that rather than some of the more um, professional services staff within the FA. Thank you so much there's just one more question from um, Charity um, she says, would you say this tension or deliberate acts of forgetting is connected to specific events or for some sort of power strike relevance? Um, if you could keep it quite short for us, Jean, in response to that, um, and then we'll take a quick break. Specific events, the Mexico um, 71 World Cup that I, that I just mentioned, um, the 
crowd in the final at that were 110,000. No FIFA Women's World Cup has approached those numbers. So it, it's deliberate acts of begetting specific events that don't fit the narrative that the FIFA and the FA and all the, all the other organisations are progressing women's football. Thank you so much. Um, there's just one comment from Katie. Um, she says, it's great to see that, uh, sorry, great to know that the current manager and players are engaging with the history and I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you so much, Jean. That was a fascinating presentation. Um, I find the work that you're doing on, on the history of these items super interesting. Um, so um, let's restart. Thank you everyone for being speedy and um, last, but by no means least, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to Elaine DeVos and her presentation. So Elaine is um, one of our amazing, I get the, the, the absolute pleasure of working with people like Elaine because she's one of our amazing um, doctoral researchers at Brunel. She has a grand ESRC Grand Union um, doctoral training program scholarship and she's researching the experiences of female boxers in the UK. And she has come to be using a material method. She's going to explain uh, why and how um, in order to explore how women in boxing gyms negotiate um, gender relations. And she's going to explore the entanglement between um, the materiality of the items in a boxer's kit bag and the gender culture of the boxing gym. And I will hand over to her. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as Louise just said, and um, I think I introduced myself at the start, but I may not have done. Um, my name is Elaine DeVos and I'm a third year doctoral researcher at Brunel University, researching the lived experience of female boxers using ethnographic principles. Um, my presentation today will be outlining a novel material method which was developed in the context of COVID and details how it's been used to explore the relationship between boxers kit and gender relations in the boxing gym. I'm hoping my slide will move on and it doesn't seem to be so. If you click on the slide to start with or right click and click next, sometimes it just needs you to do that. There we are. Yeah. Can you see it now? Have we moved on a slide? Fantastic. Great stuff. So although boxing has a long history of female participation in the UK, um, the competitive sport for women was only approved by the sanctioning body 25 years ago after a 116 year ban. Uh, gender equality in the athlete quota for the Olympic Games will be achieved for the first time in Paris 2024. And although there will be equal number of athletes, there's still one additional weight category for the men. According to recent figures, female participation has grown at more than twice the rate of male involvement, but to date most research has focused mainly on men. So my research aims to develop an understanding of the culture and real life experiences of women who take part in boxing by employing a qualitative ethnographic methodology. So in keeping with the principles, principles Elaine, of, Elaine I'm just going to stop you there because you're going one slide ahead. So can you oh, go back one slide? I do apologise. I think that's it. That's it. You're speaking to that one now. Got you. OK, yeah. I'm just going to minimise that. Can you still see my slide? Because yeah. you can. OK, yeah, you can. great. Yeah, perfect. So we're on slide four. So in keeping with the principles of ethnography, the research aims were left broad to allow for the field studies to inform and stimulate avenues of investigation, which may have not been foreseen. Now, just imagine, if you will, an empty boxing gym. That was the reality I faced shortly after I began my research, when lockdowns and other measures were brought into play as a result of COVID-19. At this point, I creatively addressed my research aims by adapting the methods used to suit this rapidly evolving situation and potential long-term uncertainty regarding site access. As one of the principles of ethnography is to allow things and artefacts to be centred, I looked to material methods to inform my understanding of the participants and their embodied experiences of being a boxer. This presentation will address how using material methods was used to explore sensory, embodied experiences that women boxers have with their kit, and how objects act as active, active agents in the negotiation of identity. So much of the existing research using material methods either asks individuals to use objects in response to questions or involves the use of items in elicitation to support discussion and pr promote a deeper emotional connection. 
According to Sarah Pink, attending to sensory experience can invite researchers to analyse from new perspectives those activities that might on the surface seem to be standard and often familiar everyday practices. So using insight drawn from others' work using material methods, by centering my interviews on the objects in the boxer's kit bag, where possible in the environment where these items are usually physically and materially engaged with, what Woodward calls an interactive and co-constructed knowledge of the impact of these items um, have on a sense of self and constructed identity was developed. In contrast to previous studies using material methods, which allowed participants to represent aspects of their identity or invoke memories using self-selected objects, the kit bag interview instead used items that are integral to the participants' everyday experiences as a boxer to elicit emotional and embodied responses. What this has in common with other research using material methods is the use of objects in exploring the connectivity between emotions and experiences. Ingold refers to the objects around us as things as they are brought to life by our interconnectedness to them. By using the everyday items of the boxer's kit bag to elicit sensuous reflexivity of the experience of being a boxer, participants are asked to consider the importance of each item and the emotions and memories that can be associated with each item from the kit bag. This will provide a new way of seeing or perhaps almost feeling the embodied experiences of being a boxer. So what exactly did the method entail? For clarity, I would like to point out that all the images and quotes used in this presentation are done so with the express consent of the participants and pseudonyms have been used unless the participant requested that I use their real name. It's worth mentioning that although the planning of these interviews was taking place during lockdown with a view to conducting them remotely using Zoom, by the time the proposed method had been refined uh, and ethics approval had been granted, it was possible for these interviews to take place face to face. I selected eight participants from contacts made during the earlier stages of my project and approached them with the concept of the kit bag interview. Before we met, I asked participants to send me a photograph of their kit bag, both where it was kept at home and where it was put when they were training in the gym. And I planned on using this as an icebreaker at the start of the interview. We then arranged a mutually convenient time to meet, ideally at their usual training facility, an hour before they were due to train both for convenience for the participants and also to incorporate the environment where they would normally train as potentially contributing towards the transition towards becoming a boxer. After firstly discussing the bag itself, which initiated conversation about the affordance and constraints of material items, we then moved on to their kit, both what they were already wearing and then the items that they brought in their kit bag for use during training. Before we even began looking at the boxing kit itself, participants were asked to talk about what they were wearing. They referred to what they were wearing, not only in terms of temperature control, comfort, support and ease of movement, but often in regards to how inappropriate they were for the sport that they were um, hoping to do. They were then asked to kit up as they would normally before a training session, whilst discussing with me the sensory and emotional responses to each item of the kit as they did so. Participants discussed the appropriateness of the kit, the cultural association of certain items of kit and how they're used, how often they're washed, how they decided what they needed to be, when they needed to be washed, when they're replaced and other aspects of hygiene and care of themselves and their kit. We also discussed any other items that they had in their kit bag, such as training aids, for example, skipping ropes, Vaseline, hygiene products, spare pieces of kit supplements, any other food items and lucky mascots, all of which gave an insight into the boxing gym experience. As with previous research using material methods, it was hoped that working directly with objects would stimulate deeper emotional responses than standard semi-structured interviews might. In addition, by working with the objects, not just as an elicitation tool, but in real time with purpose, I was able to access the right now experiences of becoming a boxer not just the abstracted memories that objects might otherwise stimulate. Visual and audio, da audio data were collected during these interviews. Thematic analysis of the kit bag, verbal transcripts and the images recorded of the interaction between the boxers, their kit and the researcher were then conducted. So now I will share my five pre preliminary themes that have been identified. 
So firstly, undoing gender norms or purposeful desexualization, as I've called it. The first theme that I've identified from my data is that women consciously avoid form fitting clothing, purposefully minimizing established ideals of feminine appearance or undoing gender norms whilst in the boxing gym. Participants discussed how they considered that the boxing gym was not a place to be attractive or for athleisure wear and often spoke disparagingly about those that wore tight fitting clothes, matching two pieces or came to the gym dolled up. Wearing a sports bra was often attributed with flattening down the chest, minimising bounce and taking on a more androgynous form. But there was one extract which stood out for its ability to touch on the entanglement of the kit with issues of gender, class and identity. So one of my participants, Mia, um, was quite eloquent on uh, these issues. So she said, I'm just going to read the quote. So I have like three lots of kit. I have my boxing stuff where I'm just like, it's all baggy and tattered and fucked. And that's like, it's kind of like the vibe and the culture anyway. Like you're not trying to be like, ooh, unless you walk into one of the really bougie gyms where everyone's got like nice shit, like the leggings cost a minimum of 90. Like everyone's in Lulu's. It's not like that in boxing clubs like this. We just wear whatever. And then I've got like what I call ho gear, which is like stuff that I wouldn't necessarily wear here because it's like, ooh, look at all that ass or whatever. It's like really tight leggings, maybe some animal print happening, like little crop tops. I wouldn't wear it here, but sometimes I want to feel like a bad bitch in the gym. And I'm generally anonymous because I train in places where I don't know anyone. And so I can just go in there, do my thing and leave. And then I've got I've got pole kit, which is even more like ho gear. But like, yeah, I've got multiple different things and like explaining to people like it's it's kind of sort of intersects with like the culture of whatever type of training you're doing like how you want to feel within that context. So Mia is indicating quite clearly and articulates rather well that there's an intersection between the culture of a training facility or a sport, the kit that's worn, and how what you wear in each context can make you feel. So this slide actually shows a picture that I've taken from the video because I, I used video as part of my um, analysis. So this is a snapshot taken from that video um, of Mia herself and the baggy and tattered gear that's worn by Mia in the boxing gym, she describes as culturally acceptable in boxing clubs like this, which for reference is a large, well-established North London traditional amateur boxing club. This quotes from around 45 minutes into the interview and Mia was already in boxing boots and wraps, as you can see. She'd removed her baggy club hoodie to expose her Rocky Spice t-shirt from a friend's hen do, which she was given because she was the boxer. She, comp she compares her home club to bougie boxing gyms and the class differential is highlighted by both the cost of the training kit worn in such establishments and the middle class, uh, class athleisure wear brand association that comes with it. She talks about the anonymity that she requires to take on her alternate bad bitch identity. And she visibly alters how she presents herself as she describes the little crop tops that she wouldn't wear for boxing. She mentions that what she wears both affects how she feels and is affected by the culture of the setting. It's interesting also to note that the gender dissociation with animal print, crop tops and hoe gear in general, and it not being appropriate in her mind to the culture of boxing gyms. So for the second theme, uh, which I've called here embodied account material protect protection, all participants have a secure knowledge of the purpose of the kit design and chose kit which will both protect themselves and their opponent from injury. Here we have quotes from Mia and Rosa talking about the use of groin and chest protectors. They talk about the protection that the kit offers, not just from the immediate pain of taking shots, but also from the long term effects of the damage to the body. With both males and females required to wear groin guards to protect their reproductive organs, it's worth noting that Mia's only concern for protecting her ovaries is not for the reproductive, reproductive uh, capabilities that her ovaries give her, but actually more for the hormones that they produce, which she acknowledges will protect her bone strength. So the next um, element, embodied physical capital, um, with women often experiencing disproportionate emotional labour, both in the home and in professional setting, boxing provided an opportunity for a mental time out from thoughts about other responsibilities and a sense of physical capital was uh, developed throughout their boxing training. 
perhaps the most interesting interview with regards to how the kit itself is instrumental in developing the physical capital actually came from an interview that took place in the participant's home rather than in her gym. So this is Seema and this is her kitted up towards the end of the interview, um, as she would be if she was about to spar in the ring. So she said, and I'm just going to again read the quote for you. I'm surprised by what I'm feeling right now. Yeah, I've got this sort of energy in me where I feel ready to go and spar. She was really surprised by the physiological changes that she felt in herself when she applied her kit. And here's Rosa, who was in an empty gym for the interview. And notably, again, it wasn't actually her usual gym. She was at a, a visiting, visiting another gym. So she says, if you had a heart rate monitor right now, I can feel my heart rate's gone faster. I was putting the head guard on and it's kind of like, I don't know, your body's like, I recognize this. I think someone's going to punch you in the face right now. So the embodied action of putting on the kit and the associated physiological response, particularly to the head guard and mouth guard, highlights the complexity of the dynamic relationship between the boxer and the kit, regardless of the environment. It's not as one might imagine the proximity to the danger of sparring that causes these physiological changes, such as increased heart rate and sweating, but rather the association of the kit to previous experiences, highlighting the right now benefits of asking participants to engage with their kit in an active way. Confidence and empowerment was the next, um, uh, the next, uh, what's the word? <laughs> it doesn't matter. As several authors have asserted, sport can offer women an opportunity to construct a new version of themselves outside the established ideas of femininity. Participants conveyed an awareness of feeling like a different version of themselves within their boxing kit, more capable and confident. Sanya here uh, directly referred to the notion that women are often valued for their appearance over anything else and that boxing gave her not just physical strength, but also an inner strength and confidence that she could look after herself. And finally, making men's kit pink just isn't the same as making kit that fits a woman. So this slide that you see here is actually what was returned to me by Google um, when I searched for women's boxing gloves, because turning kit pink is exactly what we need. Um, so women aren't just small men. Boxers feel that breast protection is more important than groin guards, but breast protection is optional for competition, unlike the compulsory groin guard, and it's very poorly designed. The chest area is more regularly hit either from deflected headshots or high body shots than the groin region. Yet the equipment specifically made for female boxers is limited in its availability, often ill-fitting and not prescriptive. So here's a quote from Rosa and some snapshots from the interview to represent how using the visuals and transcripts together can really help to understand the embodied experiences of the athletes. And again, I don't know if you can see me, but obviously Rosa is showing us there that, when, well, if I read the quote again, when you're teaching people to put their hands up and their hands aren't in front enough of their face, you say, roll your arms round. And that's something you can't do with one of these. So she says, that's as far in as I can get my arms to go. They're stuck here. And she says, I've constantly got this space here when my solar plexus is where you can hit me. And if I sit my arms here, I've got all this space to the sides or the other way around. Um, so she's actually physically showing me, again, a, a benefit of having her there in the room applying the kit with me that I think would have been hard to articulate without actually being in the, in the here and now of her applying her kit. So in conclusion, by foregrounding the material in our methods and analysis, we can focus on the importance of things and how they're enmeshed with our emotional and physical experiences, how we feel and express our identity. By using novel data collection methods, such as the kit bag interview, we can gain a deeper understanding of complex concepts, such as identity, meaning and purpose, and further explore the gendered culture of boxing with a view to impacting policy and practice. So that is me done. I've got a couple of slides of references, which obviously when I forward these on uh, later, you can all peruse at your leisure, but I shall stop sharing now. And Louise, I will hand Thank over you. to you. Thanks, Elaine. Fantastic uh, presentation with many things uh, coming to the fore around the method, but also the, the findings fr from the method. Um, any questions for Elaine? So, Beck, um, what was the most surprising outcome of your research? Uh, thank you, Beck. Um, yeah, I guess, as I 
sort of mentioned during uh, my presentation, I think the most surprising thing for me was how surprised the boxers were with their actual association to their kit and applying it and how that made them feel. Um, and I think that was really, for me, the thing that stood out as purposefully involving people with the objects that they use every day can actually make them see their existence as different than if you'd have just interviewed somebody. So it was a little bit like Sophie said about walking people through their houses and them wanting to understand whether they were good or bad in you know the, the grand scheme of things with people and how they hoarded or how they kept their objects or stored things that they didn't use. Mm. Um, it, it allowed the boxers to actually access parts of their emotional connection to their identity, I guess, that they created when using the kit, which I think if I was just to interview, in fact, I have interviewed boxers about being a boxer and what it's like to be in a gym and what it's like to be a female in the gym. And the responses I got were quite significantly different to the gendered responses that they gave in association to actually putting the kit on. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't just the environment that they're boxing in, but actually the affordance of some of the items that they were wearing that I don't know that they would have accessed quite as readily had they not been doing the application or the use of the kit as they were talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was... Yeah. Connects back with a point Mary made while you were talking about you know, because we're all thinking about this as a way of more deeply engaging people in um, in, in a topic or, or in, a, in a dialogue. And the question of whether it is deeper and more truthful or it's a safer space to create some distance. I mean, I don't, we can't get into what's true and, and the notion of truth. But I, I think that there's a really interesting wider discussion around, um, I guess, authentic responses real responses and what those mean in the context of Mary's question as well. Um, Absolutely. I, as yeah. I say, the most fascinating bit for me and indeed the boxers was the the literal physiological changes. They started to sweat, their heart rate increased, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their breathing, yeah. you know, they, they felt like they were about to get into a boxing gym and one of them was sitting in her front room. So yeah. that that for me was the most most interesting aspect of, of the method. Yeah. Um, Oberyn, you have your hand up. Do ask a question and I'll come to your question in the chat, Gemma. Thank you kindly. That's a most illuminating uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to know sort of why boxing? I don't know, perhaps you mentioned it earlier on and I didn't catch it, but why boxing and sort of did you um, focus on just amateur boxes or were there some of them you know, a bit more professional? And was there a bit of a difference in the way they uh, responded? Thank you, great question. Um, there's a very long story to how I came to boxing. I'll try and keep it short. Uh, basically, my master's research was looking into hypermasculinity within rugby, looking at youth male rugby players. Um, and I wanted to extend that to understand um, why women would engage in a hypermasculine sport. And I thought actually I could understand group cohesion in a team sport and why that might uh, encourage somebody to engage in a, in, in a hyper-masculine team sport because the group cohesion was the thing that was drawing them in. So I thought, well, if it's an individual sport, then that doesn't necessarily apply. So I thought that was the most extreme version of hyper-masculine individualized sport that I could think of was boxing. So I had no previous experience of boxing. I had no connections within boxing. So it was just because I found it yeah, probably the most uh, illuminating area to look at the, the thing that I was interested in. Um, I'm sorry, the second part of your question, the amateur versus professional. In the first phase of my research, I did do amateur recreational and professional boxers as my interviews, which were just verbal interviews over Zoom. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to speak to any professionals um, when I came around to do my second round because we'd just come out of COVID um, and they were all literally then going back into the competitive cycle. So they were less available for um, actually speaking to. But yeah, all the boxers I spoke to were active boxers. Um, several of them were competitive boxers, but there were a couple of recreational boxers. But at, at varying different degrees, I had a couple of national champions that I um, interviewed, but then others who, as I say, box recreationally and hadn't ever done it competitively. So. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. And a lot of the answers were common across, you know, the, di the different um, 
involvement. So that was quite in itself quite interesting. Yeah. And a uh, final question from Gemma, really probably about the thematic analysis, um, Elaine. She wondered whether you purposefully asked about gendered intersections or whether that theme was something that came through more organically. Yeah, I don't, I didn't have any specific questions about um, their experiences as a woman. So I didn't position it like that. Um, I did ask them occasionally about their kit. Did they feel like things fit them properly? So I, I, I was kind of, I was seeking them to give me gendered responses about the affordance of their kit, but I never actually said, do you find that the kit is more suited to a man than it is to you? Um, or are there any things that you wish you would change because you're a woman? that it very often came out and, and quite strongly with a couple of the women. Um, interestingly, a, a couple of people, th there are a, a few brands now that specifically make kit for women um, because, you know, surprise, surprise, women have got smaller fists, they've got smaller wrists. So they actually need support in different places. And one of the girls actually said to me that her boyfriend uses her gloves now because they fit him better because he's quite slight um, for a male. And he prefers that sort of tighter fit of the boxing gloves. So interestingly, not only did it highlight that the kit doesn't necessarily fit women, but it very often doesn't fit men. There's no sizing to the boxing kit. So, um, yeah, so I, did, I didn't specifically ask questions about their gendered experience. It, it, was, it was very apparently part of their experience that I, did, I didn't really need to search for. Great. Thank you, Elaine. I think that's um, that's all the questions. Um, so it just remains for me to make a couple of final comments, Elaine. Are you happy for me to go ahead and do that? Absolutely, you, absolutely. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, obviously, I, I want to start by, by thanking our presenters today. Uh, we've had three amazing talks um, exploring various issues um, around materiality and object research, which I think people will have found not just interesting, but really useful as they take that into uh, their future work. I'm sure that the, the speakers will be more than happy to um, answer questions going forward. We can probably gather those if, if you want to send them to us and we will share the recording and, um, and the slides um, as well. I just wanted to make a, a, just a couple of really quick comments based on, on the presentations uh, today. So I've been at a funeral today. Um, it was a celebration of a long life well lived, um, and so there was much joy in it. But it reminded me and brought into sharp relief the idea of the materiality of the body, both in life and death. Um, and it was um, a, an interesting moment to come from that um, into this. And, and also um, being surrounded by the objects of um, re religion and celebration of death and uh, in, in that environment, just brought to the fore the importance of this topic that we've been talking today about today. And I think from the talks, uh, uh, there were three or four things that, that draw together um, some things to take away, I think, about the value of um, these kind of methods, but also the value of thinking about materiality in all of our research. It seems to me to be one of the most fantastic and interesting and exciting ways to elicit complex responses about all sorts of topics. And I think that's what Sophie's talking about when she talks about provocation. And I think that that came through in all of the talks um, in terms of really getting at some of the, we've talked about whether deeper is the right word, but getting at the complexity of the way people make meaning out of things. Also really central to the talks has been this idea of it allowing us to explore affect and embodied effect. We talk so much about behaviours without sometimes really thinking about the feelings, the senses, the touch sight, the impact of touch sight and sound on how we make meaning. And I think that the methods that we've been spoken to um, and heard about today really point to that um, ability to allow us to explore affect and embodiment in, in complex ways. There's also something really central about the creativity of the method, but the way the method allows people to be creative in their responses. I think that a sense of everyday creativity comes through really strongly, something that we are 
often not enabled to do in our everyday lives and the way that we are schooled in everything that we do. We have to follow the rules and regulations. And I think this method just allows for a bit of everyday creativity and imagining and a reimagining of the way we make sense of the world. And that is just really, um, just a, a really vibrant way to do things. And of course, it allows us to really get at um, these social material relationships. And what struck me today and brought me right back to some of the first sociology that I did was it really the method really centers the sociological imagination if you're thinking in terms of C. Wright Mills, because um, the idea that there is this interconnection between biography and social life in time and throughout history um, seemed to me to be also really important to the idea of materiality um, and thinking about things and objects. And, and I think my final point, it seems to be a wonderful method for exploring both the everyday and the extraordinary in equal measure. Um, and on that point, you've all been extraordinary in staying with us for Friday afternoon um, and thinking about these things. And I hope that um, we, we, can, we can develop these ideas. And if you do have any other ideas for us to do masterclasses on, or you want to, um, to work with us in that respect, please do get in touch and we'd be happy to hear that. But thank you so much. Um, and we will put these on YouTube for you to um, explore yourself. Thanks.